Can I have a seat? You Good afternoon. Could you please do your name for the court to find the last for the record? That's Francis Kimball. K-I-M-B-A-L-L. -L. And, Mr. Kimball, what is your occupation? Well, I'm a detective with the Breckenridge County Police Department. Three generations of Kimballs have served our great state of Midlands in law enforcement, and as a proud Kimball, I followed suit. How are you involved in today's case? Well, I was the lead detective on both a robbery investigation and an investigation into a skimming scheme at Rock World Amusement Park. Do you have any training in um, police work? I do. I graduated top of my class from the Breckenridge Police Academy. There I was trained in proper investigation technique and procedure for both financial crimes and robbery investigations. Do you have any experience in these two fields? I sure do. I've spent a number of years on the robbery unit at the department, and it's been 10 years now on the financial crimes unit. I've investigated over 200 cases as the lead detective. Did you use any principles or methods that are used by other professionals in your field? Of course. In law enforcement, we've got to, we've got to be 100% sure that our facts are straight. So at the academy, we learned a simple method we call it the dead sure method, and we remember it with this acronym. You determine what crime was committed. <coughs> you examine all physical evidence, and then you ascertain who was involved, and finally you discover what part each person played in the commission of the crime. Did you apply this, this method reliably to the facts of the case today? Sure did. I followed it to the letter. Did you examine all relevant facts and data in the course of your investigation? I did. I interviewed all, all witnesses who had knowledge of the skimming scheme or the robbery at Rockter World. I conducted an audit of Rockter World's financial records. I did a thorough survey of the park, collecting all physical evidence that I could. Now, Investigator Kimball, I'd like to go through each of the four steps of your investigation. Did you discover what crimes were committed? I did. Eyewitness testimony and physical evidence showed that the ticket booth at Rockter World was robbed on August 30th, 2012. And I also confirmed that a skimming scheme took revenue from the park during the summer. Now, what did you discover the method that the skimming scheme was? Well, I interviewed the park's accountant, Haley Floyd, and I discovered that there was a potential flaw in the accounting system based on the fact that they, Rockter World sold the $35 World Tour Passes and the cheaper $20 regular admissions tickets. How would the skimming scheme work? Well, the way it was explained to me, what could happen is a customer who came in and paid in cash, that could be rang in as a regular admissions ticket, and then the ticket taker <coughs> could take those $15 difference between the two tickets and they could pocket that money. Just a simple skimming scheme. Now I want to move on to the second step of your investigation. Did you examine any physical evidence that confirmed the skimming scheme was taking place? Well, I did. That audit of the park's financial records, the numbers showed that the pattern that would be exhibited by a skimming scheme was present. Furthermore, I observed that there were off-color, fake world tour wristbands being used in the park that would be necessary for this scheme to be committed. I found these in an employee's locker along with a can of hairspray. Did you examine any other physical evidence? I did. I examined uh, the, the, the defendant, Ms. Bowman's cell phone, and I also had an eyewitness recording of the events that happened, the robbery escape specifically, and it was these two pieces of evidence that I used for my next step to ascertain who was involved in the robbery. Investigator Kimball, did you find out who was involved in the robbery? Well, I did. Eyewitnesses watched Cameron Poole rob the ticket booth, and that box of fake world tour wristbands that I mentioned just a moment ago, well, that was in Cameron Poole's locker. Was there any evidence that you found that implicated anyone else aiding or in also involved in the robbery? Well, yes. Like I said, I recovered the defendant's cell phone. And it was what was on that cell phone that gave me probable <coughs> cause to believe that the defendant was involved in both the skimming scheme and the robbery. And I'm now approaching opposing counsel, who has been previously marked as State Exhibit 2. Permission to approach the witness? You may. Investigator Kimball, do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. And could you explain to it what it is to the court? Absolutely. This is a screenshot of the text messages that I took, and it was on, uh, excuse me, quit Bowman's phone, August 30th, 2012, the day of the robbery. 
Is this a fair and accurate representation of that screenshot you took on August 30? Yes, it is. Could you identify who the, who the parties in the, in the text messages were? I was able to. Ms. Bowman admitted that the texts on the right side of the screen, those were Whit Bowman's, and I did confirm that the other speaker in the conversation was Cameron Poole. Objection, Your Honor. Foundation. May I respond? May I explain? Elaborate, yes. The uh, witness said that they confirmed that the, 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 text messages, the text messages in which Whit Bowman received were from Karen Poole. There's no foundation as to how he knows this fact. Yeah, maybe heard. Um, the very next question will go into the witness's um, thought process and professional opinion of why he thought it was Cameron Poole. Okay, I'm going to overrule it for now, conditional upon the fact that they will lay that foundation. If you feel that foundation has been laid, you may renew your objection. Yes, Your Honor. How did you know that these text messages on the left were from Cameron Poole? Well, the contact in the phone was named S. Cam. Now, I did investigate and I did not discover, I did discover that Quit Ballman and Cameron Poole were very good friends. Furthermore, I didn't discover any relations or friends of Ms. Bowman in the course of my investigation that were named Cam. In addition, these text messages mention entering and exiting from the Tunnel of Terror on August 30th at these same times. Objection, Your Honor. Uh, testimony based on hearsay. Yes, Your Honor. Um, as an expert investigator, a professional investigator, this witness can rely on hearsay to um, hearsay that is pertinent to his conclusions in today's case. Maris, why not? Sure. Uh, the opposing counsel is using this expert as a conduit to hearsay to lay foundation for these text messages uh, to come into evidence. Yeah, maybe heard. Mm -hmm. um, in order for this witness to go about his professional investigation, he had to use this hearsay to confirm that these text messages were from Cameron Poole, therefore it's admissible. He was used it directly in his conclusions. Yeah, I think since no specific statements have been elicited yet, they're not using him as a conduit for hearsay, so I think it's a little premature until they get to the specific statements themselves. So I'm going to overrule. Yes, Your Honor. Could you please um, continue? Well, absolutely. What I was saying was these times that mention entering and exiting the Tunnel of Terror, they were at the same time that Cameron Poole is known to have used those, e those exits. It was very clear that it was Cameron Poole. Are you going to have this time the state moves on, on Prosecution Exhibit 2 into evidence? Okay. Objection, Your Honor? Yes. Um, insufficient authentication. Um, this witness, the, the opposing counsel has not laid enough foundation. And of course, Rule 901, to support that these messages are in fact from Karen Poole. He's telling the members of the jury how uh, times may linked up, but no evidence has been suggested that these text messages were in fact from Karen Poole. The only mention he has made is as can, but, no, but again, no foundation has been laid for it to be authenticated to Karen Poole. You know, may be heard. Yes. Um, could I reference the court to case law state v. Beckett? Okay. It's on page four of the relevant Midlands case law. I'm familiar with the case law, counselor. Are you, you are? Okay. Um, Sidney Beckett said threatening text messages received by the victim and a victim on a cell phone were properly authenticated when circumstantial evidence provided adequate proof that the messages were sent by the defendant. Now what this says is that the, that the witness needs to give the court circumstantial evidence that this was Cameron Poole and through his rationale in the last question, the circumstantial evidence has been given and that bar has been met. I respond to the case law, Your Honor? You may. Uh, the very beginning of the, of the description of the case law says threatening text messages received by the victim. Now, uh, not, not uh, citing specific text messages, but nowhere in this document does it say any threatening messages. And also, the person receiving the text messages, i.e. Miss Whit Bowman, she's not the victim in today's case. The opposing counsel clearly stated in their opening statement that the victim is Officer Winnie Thomas. Yeah, maybe you heard. You may. Um, the the threatening tax messages and the defendant, that's just the context of the case in 2007. The important part is that the circumstantial evidence authenticated the tax messages and who the sender was. Your Honor, may I respond? Sure. Uh, the case law gives no uh, leadway in its definition. It clearly states that it must be received by a victim and the victim must have received threatening tax messages. Nowhere in uh, this screenshot of text messages does it state anything uh, threatening. May I be heard? No. Um, my understanding of the case law as I read it is that was the contextual situation for that case specifically um, and that we can take the ruling in this case and apply it to similar circumstances. Based on my reading of the case law, I think um, circumstantial evidence can be used to authenticate 
these text messages, so I'm going to admit them unless you have any additional objection. No, Your Honor, I stand by my argument. Okay, then they will be admitted into evidence. Yeah, um, you have permission, permission at this time for the witness to step down and make use of a demonstrative? Sure. It's just the same as the um, exhibit, or as the evidence center. Now, Investigator Kimball, what do the text messages show? Well, here, these are the text messages from Cameron Poole. They mentioned, got to get box. Now, this box here corresponded to that box of fake World Tour wristbands that I found in the course of my investigation. Now, the important part is here, the defendant's response. Now, did someone let Cameron Poole into the park? Well, absolutely. Cameron Poole had been relieved of duties on August 30th, so now Cameron Poole needed a way into the park, as you can see here. T.O.T., -T, Tunnel of Terror, 1245. It was the defendant who let Cameron Poole in, who opened that only other exit door so the Cameron Poole could get this box. Objection, Your Honor. Foundation, may we hear? Sure. Uh, the opposing counsel has allowed this witness to be an expert. Uh, the jury needs to understand the foundation in which he's, how his witness is familiar with the actions of Whit Bowman. Yeah, do you have a response to that? Um, yes, Your Honor. The witness testified in his, um, his examination or his investigation. He did several interviews of the, in, of the park employees, including Whit Bowman. Your Honor, may I respond? Yeah. That, found, that specific foundation, if he, in fact, learned this from Whit Bowman, that statement needs to be elicited here today. Your Honor, may be heard? Uh, no, Counselor, I'd like you to lay the foundation of how uh, this witness knows that Whit Bowman opened the back employee's exit door to let him in. Is it, that, that's the statement you're objecting to, right? Uh, that there's not foundation for that statement? Uh, that was what the uh, witness was testifying to. Uh, Your Honor, may I be heard for, uh, we're entering this as a professional opinion. Through, his, through the text messages and through his professional reasoning, through these text messages and knowing who the senders are, that Whit Bowman did do that. Okay, do you want to respond to that? Your Honor, this witness, though, he's been credited as an expert. He's an expert in his field. But the jury needs to understand where he's getting his knowledge from. Him broadly saying that he did an investigation is not sufficient for the jury to understand how this witness knows that. There's if the foundation was not laid, then this witness could continue testifying to facts in which the jury has no knowledge of how he even got it. May I respond to that? Briefly. Um, that um, type of information for an expert is open up to cross-examination um, for the defense on to where the conclusions are for this um, professional. As I stated before, I think you need to lay the foundation as to how he knows that to make the inference from what, what's appearing on the text messages to the fact that he actually opened the door. Uh, I, I think you need to, to tie that in before the jury can hear that information. Of course, Your Honor. Sustained. Now, permission for the witness to retake a seat? Sure. Now, Investigator Kimmel, did you have any evidence that Wilbur was the one that opened that door? I do. As we heard, from Ms. Billy Isaacs, Cameron Poole entered that door while Ms. Isaacs was no longer guarding that back exit. Great. Now, was there anything else that tied the defendant to Mr. Poole's escape? Well, there was. It was the eyewitness testimony of Ms. Anya O'Donnell, who was an eyewitness to the robbery escape that established that Ms. Bowman's part in that escape. Now, what did her testimony show exactly? It showed at the, the part that Objection Bowman yet. played. Again, testimony based on hearsay. Response. Um, Your Honor, if I could reference you to motions eliminate B, um, the testimony included in the 911 call of Anya O'Donnell has been ruled by a previous court and has um, any objections to it have been denied. Okay, do you have an issue with that reading of the um, motions? They could read the testimony of that of that individual under the record, Your Honor, but this witness testifying based on hearsay, that, that, that's not proper. What specific statement are you objecting to? Uh, that he, that he the testimony he, he stated, he just said a moment ago, was based, he said after uh, reading the testimony of another individual. Now that testimony, uh, as per the order of motions, uh, was admissible, but for this witness to testify to that, uh, take it out of, possibly out of context, Your Honor, that's what the purpose of hearsay is for. Did he elicit a specific statement? No, but based on what the, the testimony is, he's testifying on its behalf. But to be clear, did he elicit a specific statement from that testimony yet? No. On the record? Okay, then at this point I'm going to overrule the objection because no specific statement has been elicited. Yes, Sean. 
And Your Honor, at this time, the state moves um, prosecution exhibit three, the 911 call of Anya O'Donnell into evidence. Okay, do you have an objection to the 911 call? Just being. Uh, per the order of motions eliminate, no objections. Okay. And anyway, at this time, we are going to play a portion of that 911 call. Sure. exit door and then everything went dark. It was the timing of this that was concerning. The lights, Whit Bowman did not turn out those lights on the Tunnel of Terror until Cameron Poole had escaped out the door. Now, what did this, the lights going out, have effect on um, Officer Mr. Thomas? Well, obviously, Officer Thomas, who was giving chase, couldn't see now and was struck by one of the ride carts, and it was Mr. Thomas being taken out of this chase that allowed Cameron Poole to escape. Was there anything else that connected with Bowman to the escape of Cameron Poole? Well, as you can see on those text messages, 8.19 p.m. That is just minutes after Cameron Poole's robbery and escape. It says, I'm out. Talk to you later. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Nothing further. 